Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the second World of Schwartz TechCast podcast. <laughs> Woohoo! We're here in sunny Hollywood in Los Angeles, here to talk about the latest tech trends impacting your business. And as always, uh, bi-weekly, I'm going to be coming here um, to talk with fabulous people in the business, in the industry of media, technology, and advertising to get their take on what's happening in our crazy world. And so this week, I have the fabulous Daniel Tibbetts, uh, who is Senior Vice President of Digital Media at Buna Murray. That is correct. <laughs> and Daniel is a superstar in the digital world and well known for many years from, it has a mobile production background and a regular production background, whatever regular means. Uh, so I thought it would be great to hear from Daniel just what, what, what his career path has been because that itself, I think, is a reflection of our business. Like what you've done is actually, you know, a journey of, her, of how digital media has been moving. So tell us a little bit about how you got here, Daniel. Well, let me just say that the highlight is clearly right now, right here, <laughs> because I was just introduced as fabulous. And <laughs> that... <laughs> <laughs> that I will take home and make sure I tell my wife. I will call you anytime you need me to say that to you. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. I like that. I'll put it on uh, my answer machine. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. So how did I get here? That is a that is a long journey and, and a story for uh, much more time than we have today. But I will <laughs> keep it brief. Yeah. Uh, I actually started my career at KPNX Channel 12 in oh. Arizona. Okay. NBC affiliate. And I was the guy, and it was also uh, the KSAZ, the CBS affiliate, and I was that guy who wrote the news promos twice a day. Today at 5, and then we'd have to go into some salacious, salacious video tease to get people to show up for the news broadcast oh, at 5 like, and like 10. like Twitter. You know, almost like Twitter, like short, get them in there. Exactly. Yeah, okay. I, I basically was in the early Twitter stage in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> Always before <laughs> your time. Way before. <laughs> uh, and, and very fortunate. I, uh, and and that's, a, that's a very difficult job, actually. Mm -hmm. And to write those twice a day, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's complicated. And I was very fortunate that I was asked to co-write and produce a reality special called Streetwise. Oh. And when that aired, um, it won two local Emmys, and I suddenly was you know, designated as the, the, the writer-producer in Arizona, right. in Phoenix, Arizona, to go to, and started working with a lot of companies. So it was a great beginning to really be... To launch you know, your career. To really launch my career early, um, and then bridge it into... Uh, Hollywood, you know, that was really kind of so my did, so sights did you, were set. So did you say, okay, in order for me to really pursue this business, I've got to get out to L.A. and do my thing? I was fortunate that uh, uh, I got to work on a couple projects here, but the real opportunity came in uh, 1995, actually. A gentleman named Ed Wilson had left Columbia TriStar, created a new syndication company called Maxim, mm -hmm. and from that I was asked to go work at that company. Within a year, we were bought by CBS, and that became CBS Enterprises. So we were launching Martha Stewart in daytime syndication. We were launching a lot of the early action hours that you saw in the 90s, mm -hmm. like Pensacola, Wings of Gold with James Brolin, or <laughs> Sci Factor, Chronicles of the Paranormal with Dan Aykroyd. I was a part of that group of right. action television adventure production. television. <laughs> exactly, action adventure television. And certainly Hercules and Xena you know, led the way oh, for- Oh, I loved Hercules and Xena. Those were great shows. Yeah, really were. <laughs> Every Saturday night, eight o'clock, I, I was in front of the TV. I still have my Xena doll because she was she represented powerful womanhood to me. Yes, you know, as, even as a non non lesbian, I loved her. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. No, my wife my wife wouldn't wouldn't miss. It's awesome. So, I don't know okay. why we watched Hercules, but it, uh, I don't know. Maybe it was he the was, He's a great actor. He was a great actor, <laughs> Kevin right. Sorbo. And I got to work with him again, actually, when I went off to Fireworks and we did a show called Andromeda. Oh, yeah. So, he did Andromeda, too. That's he did. Right. He did. Yeah, because I'm a total sci-fi, fantasy, you know, freakazoid girl. So. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> You're a freakazoid girl. <laughs> I am. Deep down, the inner me. <laughs> now, you had a, a big stint with a mobile company, and that's how we met. And yes. you were, again... 
in the front there because nobody was talking about mobile and video on mobile. So tell us about that because that's how I think of you as the guy who was first talking about video on the phones. Well, I'll, I'll lead to that by saying I was at Fox and I was running the Fox Lab and production for 20th Television. And a good friend of mine had named Ted Eccles had brought a Nokia 6600 back from the UK into the US. Does everyone remember Nokia? Yeah, Nokia <laughs> was 80% of the market share back of in mobile the phones globally at, at the time. And, and by the way, as a side note, Nokia is a great example of a brand who, you know, was at the top for a long time and now gone. Yeah, so mean, it's like you can't even take a nap in this town. You and know? It, everything changes. Everything changes. There yeah. was a video screen on the phone. And at that time, there were no video screens on phones in this country. I started putting content on it. At Fox, we went and we sold the idea of creating an original series for mobile to Verizon. Wow. Yeah. And when that launched in, it was February 9th, uh, 2005, I kind of looked around and said, wow, this is the future. This is where it's going. So I went to my boss at the time, the president of 20th Television, said, I'm going to go make television for cell phones. And he looked at me like... You were crazy. I had, I'd lost my mind. Right. And he said, you've had a great career in television. What are you doing? Yeah, wh what are you doing? Right. And I said, Bob, this that's going to be the next big thing. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> and I want to be there. I'm so used to that <laughs> crazy look, by the way, both in my professional life and my personal life. Right, <laughs> right. But yeah, that crazy thing. So he said goodbye, or did he say, I want to help you, or He's, I want to invest? He, it, was, it was good luck, you know, oh, okay. and, and absolutely, you know, great support system with yeah. so many of the people I've worked with over the years, and great support system with my wife, who right. was, okay. Willing. Yeah, okay, Willing. let's, let's see where this goes. She trusted that you, you knew what you were doing. Correct. Right. And uh, through, through several months of working with various people and putting together business plans and really looking at what that market was going to be, I ended up being recruited by two venture groups, Bessemer Ventures and Charles River Ventures, to come into a technology company that was called VSTAR. And they created the first multimedia player on a cell phone in this country. It was a downloadable app in 2003, 2004, so at that same time. And they were looking for somebody that knew how to make content. Right. And so we, I went in, and we literally launched with one product on Sprint. And it was a lot of, you know, taking uh, Desperate Housewives and cutting it down five minutes and then putting it on the snacks, phone. Snacks, video snacks. Little right. snack, video snacks. And a lot of that, the, 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 um, uh, the length of content was really dictated by the carrier's capabilities at that point, right, right? Right, right? It's not that we didn't want to make longer content. It's that the carrier speeds, you know, this is before 4G. This is before 3G. And no Wi-Fi really yet publicly and you know, right. people weren't like just showing up somewhere and logging on yeah we you you were delivering video streams that essentially were one frame every six seconds right so we were delivering radio and that's what everyone was used to anyway online too was all that tiny little quick time movies that you know were blurry and small and crazy correct yeah and so what we did is we looked at and we said what what are the channel verticals what are the audiences that we think are going to be the early adopters to this technology and that we could program to so the first channel we launched in that category was called hip hop official and it was uh, African American youth hip hop lifestyle and culture oh. and it worked it was very and successful and what made you pick that vertical cuz i know lifestyle verticals are the first thing that any new platform goes after why is that like why hip hop hip hop because we we saw the trends of again young urban african americans were the early adopters of those devices so it from was a, a cool trend technographic thing technographic perspective understanding what technology that demographic used you knew they were early adopters correct. and you could bang on that correct and that's still true correct right that's still true and, and also with with second gen hispanics they're very quick on on early adoption well and we saw the success of hip hop official so another channel we launched was s musica which was a Latin-based, again, okay. music lifestyle. Right. I love that. So you're you're using the new tech platform based on knowing the data around the demographic you're going after, which is still what you're doing. Correct. Okay. Correct. So we, you know, so again, very early stage. And again, in those days, right, we're talking 2005, 2006, 2007, there weren't smartphones. So the iPhone hadn't come out yet. So we were dealing with what so we weird. called at the time. <laughs> yeah, isn't that, and it's not that long ago. Right. You know, we were dealing with what we call feature phones. Mm -hmm. And you had thousands, literally thousands of variety of phone systems and operating systems and carrier systems that you had to 
create applications and video players for and then port, right? We use the term port where we're literally making it work on all of those different right, phones. Right, so you spit it the same file out a hundred different ways to work on all these different right, phones. Right, because every screen was different, every right. functionality was different. Which is still kind different. of true in some cases with interactive television right now. Absolutely. You know, not so much with web stuff because of responsive design, but you're still making the same thing a hundred different ways, right? Even Even Android, you know, yeah. pe people look at Apple and go, well, it's Apple, but there's still various versions now of Apple and yes. screen sizes and et cetera. But Android devices, there's many. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 techno the technology difficulties are still there, but it's far easier. We don't have, you know, again, we called them SKUs, each phone, each operating system. That permutation of items was Has a gone SKU. Down. And there were thousands of them that we would have to Got port it. to. And from a metric standpoint, we would simply look at, okay, what phones are selling the most? And those are the ones we're going to prioritize. The other difference is at that time, there's nothing you did on your phone for free, right? Right. You right, paid okay, gotcha. for everything. And in that environment, it was typically $4.99 a month. So if you wanted one of these video channels, you would pay $4.99 a month. Wow. And that was the only way to do it. Right. In 2007, 2008, really when the iPhone came out, that was a, a huge shift for our company simply because at that time, Apple hadn't yet uh, implemented the reoccurring payment system. Right, right. And, Mic also, and micropayments. And, and micropayments, in-app payments. None right. of that existed. Right. So That's our crazy. economic <laughs> model had a shift, and we created a dynamic ad server so that we could just start putting ads in front of that content. Right. Uh, and again, trying to go out to the market and convince everyone, hey, you can you can get a you know a 10 second a 15 second ad on mobile right and of course the first reaction is why would i do that who's right. watching mobile right and but but i also love that it's always about how am i going to monetize this no matter what i mean it's got to be about how am i going to monetize this well and, and i i realized it in month one when uh when we and we were again really first on the iphone and we were part of the development process of android because uh, one of our core investors was Motorola. So as they were launching Android as an operating system, we were there to make sure all of our product launched oh, with those nice. phones. Oh, that's nice. Okay, got it. But the realization of a consumer paying one ninety nine as a one-time payment, $1.99 as yes. a one-time payment, but then I was supplying content to them on a daily basis. Too expensive. Forever, right? Yes. As long as they had that app, suddenly you know, my brain exploded and went, Whoa! This is this is a really bad business now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the mobile business anymore. <laughs> well, and jumping ahead because I know there was a lot in between. You now are running digital at one of the top reality production companies globally, right? So tell us about Buna Murray because it's part of Banajay, which is a big global reality production company, right? So t tell us about. Yeah. So so uh, Buna Murray. Uh, as you stated, is a large-scale <laughs> reality. Just so you know, I was worried about saying Bunim wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, large-scale, large-scale reality production company. And actually, uh, John Murray and Mary Ellis Bunim, the founders of the company, are uh, acknowledged in the Television Hall of Fame as creating the reality genre. Okay, yeah. And so they, they were there first. They were there with the real world. Oh, they right, were the okay. ones who created the and real I watched world. That show. Okay. And and started it all. And we are now, you know, 22 years and 30 seasons later of the real world, wow. which wow. is a real testament to that format wow. and, and wow. how reality has changed so in much. those 22 years. Now there's three Emmy categories for reality programming. Co like yeah. I always look to awards as a pattern for the industry, and there's literally three different formats that get Emmys. Yeah, just for reality. reality. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. it's it's phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, the, the company uh, has produced a lot of programming now, uh, responsible for the Kardashian franchise and all the different spin-offs and variations right. of that over the years. I, I appreciate that show because the, the badonka donk now is okay to have right <laughs> as a regular person so I appreciate that <laughs> That's good. they made it cool <laughs> to have that and also um, project runway yes which is always winning Emmys yep. and uh, and I love that show too um, it's like intelligent you know in, in its own way yeah so it's, it's a wonderful show and also yep. our, our uh, I don't know if it's the newest hit, but certainly another big hit we have on E! Entertainment is uh, Total Divas. So are you guys producing a show based on uh, someone comes and brings an idea to you? Or is E! coming and saying, will you guys make this for us? Or how, how does the model work? Like, what happens first? It's, it's really all of the above, right? Uh, a network, what, I think what we're known for is great storytelling, first and foremost, right? 
we're storytellers. We're also known for our casting. We find unbelievable yeah, casts. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay, right. Um, and then third, not not something that we're known for from a public perception, but from an industry per- perception is our, our infrastructure, our process, our ability to produce and deliver high quality shows to the network. And, you know, that that is a hard thing to do. And that's something that from a production company standpoint, uh, we have a, a very solid reputation. So yes, E Entertainment, MTV, Oxygen, Lifetime, okay. they say, hey, we bought this, we love this, we want to do this. Can you develop it, find the story, and, and will you it, deliver it because we trust you. Okay. Um, we also take pitches and find that gem, develop it, and sell it, as well as just internally. We have a tremendous amount of brainstorming sessions where it's, here's here's what's happening at MTV. Here's the trends that are taking place. What do we have? What do we want to do that can do that? Because if you really look at what the company's done, it's rebranded the programming and the networks of E! Entertainment, MTV, and Oxygen. Right. Before the real world, there were music videos you know before bad girls club on oxygen it was you know terror dice and what you know wild on right you know even e entertainment so you're or, recreating all these networks you're helping them build their brand correct right that's that's so interesting so you came on a couple years ago when they had no digital group correct, correct? and your charge was what to make digital stuff or how 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 exactly did they lay out the role to you yeah, I, I, I've known uh, Gil Goldshine, who's the president of Una Murray and John Murray for many, many years. And uh, they are innovators. I mean, they really look and they say, how are we going to you know, continue the success and the innovation we have? And matter of fact, it's, it's kind of known amongst the employees in the company. Everybody shows up every day and asks themselves the question, how am I going to innovate? Our, our leader, our CEO, John Murray, created the reality genre. What am I doing today? So I, lo- you know? I love that because that means it's coming from the top. Yes. And I can tell you from being in a large corporation for many years that everyone was always like, I want to innovate. But it was only because that was the cool thing to say. It wasn't because it was breathing out of the building. you know. So, it's, so for you guys, it's there because your leadership has established that culture. Absolutely. There, yeah. in, in Innovator's Dilemma, right, it talks about if an established existing company is going to truly innovate and create a, a new market to go after, there's really only two ways you can do it, right, is to completely separate and do so away from the parent company because the values and processes and resources don't allow it, right, and rightfully so, to be that innovative. Or, you really have to have the support of the CEO to prioritize that innovation. And in that book, there's only one example they give in which a company was successful by built by innovating really to that extent internally, and it was because the CEO had supported. So I look at what I do is that I'm an entrepreneur, right? I exist to create a, a an inter interpreneur. Oh, I love that. So I'm I'm inside an existing company, but I'm there to be an entrepreneur, but I'm not. Did right? you, by the way, trademark that? Because I think that's that's cool what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm borrowing it from Innovator's Dilemma. Okay. It's actually And in who wrote that book? Because that sounds like a great book to read. I'm not going to remember. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you can look it up okay. on so, Amazon. So, because you're, I know every time I meet you, you're giving me five or six great new books to read. So, you're one of those people that just gifts your friends with great books to read. So, Innovator's Dilemma. Yeah, Innovator's Dilemma is, okay. uh, is a great resource to uh, to really understand. Again, the, the, the basic principle of it is every company has uh, a set of values, processes, and resources in which they need to operate. And you can't disrupt that. The reason those companies are successful is because they've built those processes like BMP to be able to scale and and produce you know a lot of programming we have at any one point 850 employees you know yes. making content so that's massive and is that just for the US Buna Murray or is that for the mothership so that's ba- just Buna Murray okay so Banerjee is a big global company that bought Buna Murray correct in 2010 ago, in 2010 and why why would they do that like what was their group the the so Banerjee think of Banerjee if you're familiar with companies like Endemol or Fremantle they are large-scale distribution companies and production companies that are creating formats that then you can sell globally. And when you say so when you think, format, what do so you So if you think of American Idol, The Voice, those are formats that The Voice exists as a show in other countries. It's not the American version okay. we watch. It's the Australian version. It's the German version. It's the Are UK version. Are they like version. drunker in German when they do it? <laughs> German? They do, like, what's the difference? <laughs> it's just funny to think about, like, what are the subtle cultural differences? In each, in each uh, country. Yeah. 
And so ultimately, the, the business is predicated on is if you can create a hit show in one country, then the odds of success in other countries, right, makes it a little bit more plausible for a network to buy into it. If you think of The Office, right, The Office was a UK, sitcom format UK, right. out of the UK, and therefore they literally took the scripts and said, now let's cast these actors right, right. and we'll make it, you know, we'll get rid and of all House the British terms. House of Cards terms. was an uh, Israeli show, right? Wasn't House of Cards an Israeli show? I, that I don't know. I think I know it, was, it was, but, but okay. yeah. I know get, it was developed point. prior. But so, it, okay. so the idea, the, the kind of the next generation or the new generation of big media companies is retaining and distributing those format rights so that you can have hit shows in multiple countries. And you still make money and you own the IP of Correct. the format. So they bought Buna Murray so that they could have a arm in the U.S., basically? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, so there's um, 15 production companies in 10 different countries wow. under the Banerjee banner. Okay. And, the again, the all the companies get together and they share their formats. And so if we've got something we're selling in the U.S., other countries may go, oh, that would work great here. And then suddenly, you know, that same format, the work that's been done to create it, is then sold internationally. Well, that is fascinating. So I'm actually talking to a global guy now. <laughs> you're a global <laughs> yeah. guy. All right, so you global. come you come to Buna Murray a couple of years ago, and you're like, I'm going to help you build out digital. So what does that exactly mean? Are you just helping them put video online of their shows, or what does that actually mean? Yeah, the so when um, uh, w the transition was, we were in the process of selling Go TV to another company. Okay. And I Go TV was your mobile company. Correct. Go right. TV was the mobile company, and it, mm -hmm. we were selling it. And instead of staying retained with the buyer, I had an opportunity. Gil Goldshine approached me and said, "Hey, we really want to ramp up digital. We see where the future is going. We want to make sure we are there." There, right. And so the transition was looking at what would you do in that environment, and that goes back to looking at well, I have to create that separate alternative production entity because my value processes and resources are going to be different. So we literally, you can think of it as as I'm I'm in a separate building, mm -hmm. right, from my from my company, and we drew a dotted line down the middle of the street and said, look, I'm going to. I'm going to produce things different. I'm going to hire people different. I'm going to uh, create the formats differently because what we do in quote unquote digital is different than what we do in television. Now, that has merged over the last three years, but going back three years ago, there were a couple things that I said uh, that I was going to look at. One is most traditional US based production companies don't own their library of content, right? the network owns that content. So the idea of going in and saying, I'm going to take the real world and the Kardashians and syndicate those episodes on digital platforms, that's not uh, that's not possible, right? Because there's there's no business them. there because we don't own them. Right. So what we, and, and the other thing at the time I looked at is I said, what I, what I also want to be careful of is I don't want to be the guy who says, let's go into MTV or any of these other networks and try to take our existing shows and create a digital extension to it. Why? Because the networks owned them, and the network had digital departments that were going to control So they were them. already doing that. They right? were already doing it. That's right. where the world was at that time. So what I did is I really focused on creating short form and even long form content that was different than what BMP, Buena Murray Productions, would normally produce, and then be able to sell it to portals, portals meaning like the Yahoo's, the AOL's, the, the so YouTube. Were, so it was new shows. New shows. Completely new shows that that the production company owned, BM owned. Correct. So they could do whatever they wanted with it. Correct. Okay. So one example is we were a few years ago, um, Google and YouTube had an initiative where they were funding a variety of channels in the marketplace. And we Robert, had Robert Kinsel's. Robert thing, Kinsel's, okay. yep. And so we partnered with a company called Alchemy Networks, uh, which is a uh, entertainment media distribution company targeting young African Americans. And we said, and, and uh, the relationship that I had from uh, Go TV, we said, look, let's let's be the production partner, and we're going to create content on a daily basis. And I, Bjorn Murray, I'm going to create a studio, and I'm going to hire a lot of young amazing talent that we're going to give all the resources and tools to to come in and create love it okay and that's what we did and that's how the channel breakdown came up came about we were then able in success to sell that as a tv show to bounce bounce tv as 16 half hours uh for season one that broadcast this last you know so it this started out as a digital show 
on on web and yeah then, on YouTube and then you sold it for its second window to bounce TV actually we we sold the concept and the creativity that went behind it and we created the half hour show okay. breakdown we didn't take what we had done online and repackage it and put it together and, and the reason is I, I don't really look at that you can take a it depends the show, yeah. but you're not going to necessarily take a bunch of short form content, and tie it, it together, together, and then at least for that particular network and how we were producing the show, Awesomeness has for the most part done an excellent job of taking a lot of uh, short form things. content from their network and putting it on Nickelodeon. And making it longer. Yeah, and that, different and demographic, right. different group. And I know now that when a writer sits down, they're not thinking, they may be thinking, okay, this is a you know, um, a scripted network show for 45 minutes, or they're thinking this is a web series for 15 minutes, but in the back of their head, and I'm sure the producer has said to them, but we're going to resell it and package it in a year, so make sure it also works, or write what additional content we need to make it work mushed together, or shorter or longer. Absolutely. So now all of a sudden, as a writer and a producer and a content creator, you have to think of the formats that your show's going out to a year or two later yeah. because you're going to be able to monetize that. Yeah, right? absolutely. The, 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 the truth is the television game, digital television, whatever, hasn't changed much, right? You still have to find alternative lines of revenue for your mm -hmm. content. I mean, television exists because, you know, the, the U.S. networks get, pay you a license fee and then the deficit is made up through international distribution, syndication, digital, you know, VOD sales. All of those things add up to money that business right and so digital is really no different to to create just a digital show for the sake of a digital platform that doesn't make sense to create a digital show that can then either a be syndicated or repackaged and or the brand is strong enough that it can be recreated into other forms that's the key got it and so and i know now um because i want to get to our next segment but before we do so you had talked about there was a dotted line when you first got mm -hmm. there separating out digital now you've merged back to the regular production company? No, what's interesting is, so the evolution uh, and, and what we're seeing is, uh, one, I believe that in three to five years, there isn't a digital group and a traditional it television every, group, it's just group at the networks right. or production companies. It's yeah, you're just people it's content. Stuff, right. It's content and who is the right group, group or people or processes for the particular platforms. The, the, the beauty of today's industry is there's far more buyers than there's ever been before. Distribution, which which really used to be the wall garden, is now open and free. You can, if you have content, you know, it goes back to content is king. If you have content, there's so many places to go take it. But there is, just as there's different expertise needed to create a sitcom versus a drama, it's the same if you're creating for different platforms. But what's happening is if you think about Xbox and Netflix and Amazon, those are TV, right? right? Those are right. TV experiences. So there's really no difference for the most part in how you're going to produce for those. So, so one is I'm going to keep creating alternative productions for the company, working with brands, working with any, any buyer possible. Knowing that you have this connected environment. Correct. And that connected environment is becoming more and more. It's definitely trending that way. The second thing that's really changed a lot is, and we did this, we, we found a unique technology a few years ago called U2, Y-O-U-T-O-O. -O. And it was the idea that somebody could be sitting at home, take video of themselves, and put it within the broadcast episode oh, that's so cool. in real time. And perfect for reality. Perfect for reality. Right. So we, we packaged it up, we took it to one of the networks, talked about how we would work it within one of our shows, and the response was so positive. The reaction from the creative side of the network work was I wish all of our production partners would think this way right. and the difference was we were talking to the creative side we were talking about right, right. Uh, changing the story level and adding more content so giving them to tools, the network giving them tools which I always used to talk about to creatively enable the storytelling correct and you're bringing it to them Right? So Bringing then, it to our creative production it. team, who then said to the network, Here's what look we at what do. we can do with this. Right. And that was a game changer. The, and, and because it started to become the way of thinking, not only at the networks, but within our own company, that I now spend a quite, a, quite a bit of my time in front of the cable and broadcast networks, pitching shows with our TV group that start with 
you know, great stories, but all that interactivity, that engagement, that social environment that has to be created to bring people back to the TV is built from day one. It's not an afterthought. The right. problem with the industry is people create great shows and they go, oh, how do we make it social? It doesn't work that way. It needs to be part of it from the day from one. Day one. And, and that's what you guys are doing. And that's what we're doing now. And the, again, the response is, is uh, really fantastic, not only by the networks, but even by our parent company, Banerjee. Some of our projects we're developing together are you know, the highest priority of the company as a whole. The global company. The global so, company. And even when they're coming from the UK or Asia, where they're kind of ahead in certain areas, you're saying that the US, your, your, your arm is leading in that integration. Well, I, w I won't say we're leading it. I would say... <laughs> those I, are my words. <laughs> those are Laura's words. <laughs> Just in case anybody in France is listening. <laughs> oui, who, oui. Has, who has missiles? <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we certainly have... Some of our projects are on top of the priority pile because we've really thought through that integration. But as you state, this is happening in Europe. This mm -hmm. has been happening in Europe. They've really been leading this charge for quite some time. We've struggled in the U.S. to catch up, but I think I, I now see great signs of us heading in that direction. Right, because you're you're culturally infusing the storytelling from the beginning. Yes, with that community thing. So let's go to our our next segment, which is the top trend segment. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> All right, boy, are that. my lips tired. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so Daniel, what, what are some of the top trends you're seeing um, in the business right now or even in town or just in the last few weeks, things that have really uh, that you're looking at, your team is talking about? Well, I, I would say, and we won't go back into it, but what we were just talking about is a trend the industry is now facing. Networks have to figure out how to get people to watch live, right, to get those ratings. Right. So when you see Rising Star, right, right? And we yeah. can and we can all debate is yeah. successful, not successful, but that was really the first great indication of the network saying if you wanna participate, if you wanna engage, you gotta be here live. And that's a benefit to them. So we'll see how that plays got out. Got it, got it. That's one thing. The other is uh, when you when again across the board, um, a lot of new technology plays for uh, SOD, uh, uh, I'm sorry, SVOD, okay. a subscription uh, video on, on demand, demand okay. and VOD um, networks, right? And, and not necessarily com competitors with, say, a Hulu or a Netflix, but there's definitely a, I'm, I'm going to see a growing trend over the next three to five years to a lot of competition. Really, I'm going to say against the cable companies. So can you give an example of one that's bubbling up right now? Uh, not, not, not specifically by name. I have to be careful because mm -hmm. I, I, get, I get to review and see a lot of new technologies right, right, and right. a lot of venture companies bring me things early on. Do we have to get you drunk in order to hear the, the, We have to get you drunk to <laughs> tell us the name. Well, who says I'm not drunk already? Oh, that's right. <laughs> it is Friday. Oh, there we go. God, this seat is hard. Okay. <laughs> so are you, you're not talking about Vimeo or those guys, are you? Well, or, I, th I think the company Companies like that are great okay. examples because uh, the the reality is everybody's trying to bring that over the top technology right, right directly to you to the consumer right, 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 and right. and I think so over the top is really the, the key element there right and for for people that don't call it over the top it's basically all those what you might be watching on your your browser at home all those video content channels now well, yeah when I when I look at you know again I've, I've been around a while in this industry and, and you look very young by oh, the thank way. You. I was gonna thank ask you what are you doing with your skin <laughs> <laughs> He's glowing, ladies and gentlemen. He's glowing. It's a good thing this is radio. Um, <laughs> oh wait, there's a camera. That's right. Oops. There's always a camera. <laughs> um, the uh, um, you know in the cable days, right? To get to uh, you know 40 million households was was the marker for when you really invested in original programming. But to get to 40 million households in the 90s and the early 2000s, that was a that was an expensive proposition. Right. We, when I was at Fox, we used to look at the development of new cable networks for News Corp, and the minimum investment was 100 million. Right. right Today, right. when you look at Oprah or Revolt, you know those are investments are really 200 million. But when you think about VOD, when you think about over-the-top technologies and the fact that we have all these connected televisions, really to get into a 100 million household is a $20 million proposition, right? right? right it's right. a lot easier to do it. Now, there's awareness and marketing and how do I find it and how's right. the user experience of those particular devices. And you devices. also know who you're reaching, right? Because you're Correct. on a digital platform, so you know exactly 
who's watching. It's not like you're waiting for Nielsen to send back a notebook. Yeah, every time, whether it's a connected TV this. or your phone, right. every time somebody opens it and watches something, you know what that is. Right, which is, I know when I was you know, trying to sell digital back in uh, my agency days, that was always the thing that I was saying is that you actually know. I mean, we're not pretending what the numbers are. You actually see a report of, I clicked on this thing, right? So you know. There was a, uh, um, uh, and I wish I had the exact language, but CBS put out some research data saying that they were making more money per viewer on streaming content than they were broadcast content. Wow. And that makes sense to me, though, because if I think about the way media is sold, right, per thousand, your television is about hitting the masses. But when I think about streaming online, you know, I, I've really got that engagement, and maybe I have less people streaming it, but I know who's streaming it. Right, you're down the funnel. Yeah. So you're down the funnel, and I think that's the future of all of this: is you're 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 dealing with niche audiences. Yes. But you've already done the work. I'm already reaching that millennial woman who's 24 years old, so I can sell her things as opposed to, set, set, you know, me listening to an ad about a car eight years out before I'm going to buy a car. Right. So we're really going down the funnel, which is what I love about this stuff. But a lot of people are holding on so tightly to broadcasting as opposed to, you know, what we used to call unicasting, right, <laughs> right. whatever you want to call it now. But what what about some other trends that you're seeing? Are there any um, you know, apps, devices, anything that's got your office in um, in um, North Hollywood all excited or Van Nuys? I don't know. I, so I, I don't know about all excited, but there is one we brought up recently. We have a uh, weekly, you know, department head meeting, directors meeting, where everybody from the different heads of the company sit down. And uh, myself and our vice president of digital brought up a, an app called Yo. Oh, right. right? <laughs> now, she introduced this to me, uh, and my first reaction was, Wow, you know, why do we need that, right? So right. I'm just going to describe gonna, it to folks in case it, they've been living under it, a rock. <laughs> <laughs> downloadable app that it, you know, that you can pick your contacts who you want to reach out to, mm -hmm. and the app really does just one thing. You push. So I have you in my contacts, Lori. I open my app. There's your name. I push your name, and you get a, a message, and it just says, "Yo." That's it. Y O. Right. Yo. I I, I just did downloaded it this week, and I love it. <laughs> it makes me happy. <laughs> it, so my, my knee-jerk reaction was, I don't get it. This makes no sense. Right. And it reminds me of the Facebook poke. Right. Right. right so right. and I thought, well, wait a minute. Is that still a thing? Right. But then it hit me what you just said, which is, and, and uh, Kessla Childers, who's our VP of digital, that's my shout out for Kessla. Also mm -hmm. a shout out to Abby, who Woo! I know is listening there. We're today. live, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, We're right. live here. <laughs> <laughs> and all my, no, I, I, I won't keep going. No, um, you want to say hi to your grandmother? Or anything? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you, though. Um, the, uh, but, but that's all the app does. And so when, when we were talking about it and she was explaining it, it's that moment where you just want to reach out to somebody, let them know you were thinking about them, right. but you don't necessarily want to pick up the phone or you don't necessarily want to put out a, a text, right? Because then you're even See, explaining it. See, I think it. In my, this would really help my marriage a lot. If my husband just sent me a yo every once in a while. <laughs> so, Scott, if you're out there, come on, yo me up. They, yeah. They, <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a different app. <laughs> they yo me up. <laughs> hey, let's go. Wait a minute. It. Yeah, I'm going to quick trademark. <laughs> 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 Didn't he also, the guy that wrote it, just like do it in an afternoon? Or yeah, is that he a did it like sale? in eight hours or in something. Eight, so okay. Something like that. And then people were breaking into it or something. Busting yeah. it open, but but so, so, it's, so but you it's guys a, were talking about a, it. We were talking about it because yeah. it's a great it's it is a great moment to say, look, this is another way to stay in touch with people to just remind and them that you're thinking about them. And it's captured the attention of all the major news outlets, yeah. and people are downloading it wild, like wild. And someone just told me about Yo Hodor for Game of Thrones fans, where oh. now you can send Hodor Hodor. And then I read in Israel, somebody, I think Red Alerts, or uh, I'm totally botching the name, but a news out, um, alert company partnered with Yo to send people alerts when missiles were being launched. So a more serious use of Yo, but yeah. that news outlet gets Yo's platform and audience, and Yo gets a relationship with a real company. So now you see how it's not just this silly poke thing, you know. So I love that you guys were talking about that. Yeah. So, are you have you ideated yet on how you might use it for? Are we going to see a Yo reality show? <laughs> <laughs> Where's my trademark noise? Come on. <laughs> what is that? <laughs>
that's John, our engineer yeah. here, who's uh, having some fun with some sound effects. Yeah. But um, anyway, so that's so cool. Uh, any anything else that you guys have gotten really excited about? Well, yeah, yeah, you know, sp- specifically, I mean, we could probably jump into it. But what what's great about um, what I do at the company yeah. is that's what you do. It, it's that bridge, yeah. right? Yeah. It's it's the technology companies that want to be integrated with entertainment, right, right? right? Come in and talk to us about it, and then we try to figure out how do we bridge it to. You know, on How do you that make creative it real? So side. you always have to be finding out the new stuff. Absolutely. So that's a nice bridge into our next segment, which is, you know, what's the scoop segment? And uh, for the what, what's the scoop segment? <laughs> What's the How scoop? do we get all these people I in don't here? Know. It's with very the, crowded the drums in here. And the, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's very crowded. Um, they're very nice, the musicians. Just keep your wallet away from them. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'll count my fingers. <laughs> so, for what's the scoop? How are you keeping up with all this stuff? Like, how do you sit in that meeting every week and bring new ideas? Yeah. Uh, so one every day, right? I go to uh, the the. the the trades, right? And the trades, it, it's really funny. I grew up absolutely being dedicated to reading Hollywood Reporter and Variety. Mm-hmm. And, and and the truth is, I don't anymore. Um, and not that, you know, those are valuable publications yes. and important in the industry. But but for me, I look at like Video Inc., right? Video Inc. is going to tell me what's happening with the multi-channel networks, what's happening right. with... And that's my friend Sahil Patel, who was supposed to be on the show two weeks ago, Naughty Sahil. So hopefully we'll get him again. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but it is a great, great every day and also throughout the day when there's breaking news in that video multi-channel network yes. space. So I love I, that I have too. found everything that they've put out in their sh- you know short form yeah, email he, blast yeah, he's kind of is valuable yeah. to me. And it's, I think they're doing a conference too in New York at the end of the month. Oh, okay. Which folks should check out because it's going to be filled with all the, these types of insights. Yeah, there that that's definitely. Uh, um, first thing in the morning, that's where I go. Uh, Synopsis Digital, um, you know, uh, I think it was Cynthia Turner years ago started compiling all the important things going on in the industry from a traditional standpoint and then started, you know, doing sports and kids and digital. And again, it's a great place to get an aggregation of what's going on. Like a curation of all the hot news. Yeah. So, And, and that's where you can see trends. Correct. Yeah. And, and and just to get prepared for the day so that, that I know what's happening. Um, also, uh, um, Deadline. Deadline is is still a great place. Is to it Deadline dot com or do you get their newsletter? Deadline dot com. Okay, got yeah. it. Um, so those are kind of my three must stop places to get mm-hmm. information. But the other one is just being engaged in the industry. I get to talk to people like you. Right. Right. When when we have our conversations, I always learn something. Right, it's right. all it's fun. Yeah. We have a great time. And a good meal usually. And usually a good meal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I always walk away with something to think about. Right. And right. so as much as possible you have I conversations. put myself out there to pick up the phone, call people, see what's going on. And and, and it's what's great about this industry is this everybody has different expertise. Like uh, uh, a gentleman named uh, uh, John Roberts, J.P. Mm-hmm. Roberts. Shout out to you, J.P. Hi, John. Um, <laughs> you know, he and I technically do the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of people would say, well, aren't you guys competitors? And the answer is no, because John has, you know, expertise and talents and knowledge that I don't possess right. and vice versa. And so, so you're not we really share. competing. You're kind of bridging the gaps. Absolutely. Yeah. We all have to work together because digital still, it, as much as we read about it, we see it, and it's a huge part of our life from a business standpoint, yeah. still being figured out. Right, And right. we all benefit if we can make it successful. Right. So it's sort of co-op, friendly cooperation. Yes. Um, so uh, I think we're wrapping up soon, right? Yeah, we have about four minutes. We have four minutes, ladies and gentlemen. We could do so much. So is there anything, anything, Daniel? that you think we should be looking out for? Any new shows launching? Anything that you guys are working on that you want us to check out? Well, we actually, um, so we, the on the Björn and Murray uh, Productions digital side, the stuff we've produced recently, we uh, launched a series called Stylus on Set uh, with Johnny Wujek. Johnny Wujek is a Hollywood celebrity uh, designer. You know, he, he uh, is Katy Perry's, go-to person. You've seen him in her videos. You've seen him in the movie. So are we hanging out with him? We're we're hanging out with him. And it's really, it's a fun show. Johnny uh, uh, is out helping people. Uh, You know, we have some really amazing stories of people who 
uh, just need to get their life back in check. Really need oh, to get it restarted. <laughs> <laughs> and as a matter of fact, as a surprise, Johnny, come on in. Come on in, Johnny. Go watch out for those musicians. <laughs> <laughs> That's our surprise for you today. Okay. He's going to do a complete. <laughs> you can't see it, ladies and gentlemen. He is dressed fabulously. <laughs> Johnny's amazing. And so this was a, this was a uh, uh, cooperation between Spin Media, where it, where it airs, Mindshare, which is one of the big uh, agencies, okay. advertising, you know, uh, media agencies yep. and Buren Murray Productions to put so out that the, show. I love that. So you you wrapped the business model in. You brought the advertiser in from the get go. Correct. You sat down with them and crafted the idea. Yeah, and well, in, in that particular situation, there isn't a. Uh, it's not a branded entertainment advertiser initiative. Mm -hmm. It was really Mindshare. Uh, or MEC, a division of Mindshare, going, hey, this is a you know great idea with a great piece of talent, and so we want to do this. We want to develop this so and grow are they, this are they bringing, to then go get advertisers. Okay, got it. So they're not necessarily uh, bringing the advertisers along first, but they're going to bring it afterwards. Correct. And and really, and I know we only have two minutes, but the the um, you know there's two ways to approach branded entertainment. One yes. is the brand comes in on day one, and you're creating something really you know, with their brand identity integrated, integrated mm -hmm. and you have to be careful that you're not too heavy handed. And we've right. done many projects of that nature. Uh, and then the other is more the traditional business, right, th that we know today, which is I create a show, I have a, a high level of confidence is going to obtain an audience, so I go out and sell against that to an advertiser. And, you know, look, the second is always preferable because you want to create something in a in yeah. a environment where it's just really about the audience right, right and and then package it up and bring it to an advertiser because it has value but both of those models are important for my business because they both lead towards again Making our ability money. to make money build out a team and keep doing what we do and and also i think audience wants to be in front of or hearing about the right advertisers like the right products the right things right? absolutely well and certainly when you're talking about millennials yes. right so you know millennials i think uh, you know they they don't mind being advertiser they don't mind advertising but it's how you handle it it's right. being authentic right. it's solving a problem and so if our content ultimately is providing a service let's say to an individual they don't mind if a brand is a part of that so it's really important that you find the right brand for the particular piece of content if you go sideways and you've created a great piece of content but you've got some brand in there that doesn't fit, right. everyone's gonna call you out on it. And today in social media, the, yeah. the voices of the people are so loud, right? With television, maybe people put a letter writing campaign together, but you right. could, you know, but nobody knew about it. But today, now it's the comments are public. Right. So right. It, I, I have to be true to that There's audience. There's already Twitter feeds coming in about you right now. On this? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Can we do a segment of uh, yeah, terrible tweets? Yeah, that's know? right. <laughs> and I can read them? Yeah, that's right. That would be actually a great episode. <laughs> Trademarked. Okay. Oh, okay. We're gonna we're yeah. gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more. It turns out, you lucky guy. <laughs> All right. Well, so when what if you... I just sit here and don't say anything? Well, that's what happens. That's then? always possible too, and I'll just fill <laughs> I'll it just in. Stare at I have you. a song. Do you? <laughs> just kidding. Gonna serenade me, <laughs> honey? Honey, if you're listening, turn off the radio. That's right. <laughs> I'm being serenaded well, by a beautiful woman. I do have a question for you about where do you see the future of Media Co.? And I know we didn't talk about this a lot, but because you're looking at Disney bought Maker, right? And then you see all these other companies acquiring digital arms. And then, you know, companies that were big yesterday aren't big today. And BlackBerry's gone. And Microsoft, we don't know what's going on. And so what do you see as the media company of the future? Like, how do you set yourself up for success today? for tomorrow? I mean, uh, it's a big question, but it's I, a great question. You know. uh, and it's one I've, I've you ponder. really, I pondered for many, many years. <laughs> yeah, that's right. what, what we had at GoTV was really unique, right? Because we mm -hmm. were creating a lot of different networks and we were distributing them across every broadband site and every mobile carrier almost worldwide, right? right? right. And, and that's really what the MCN or the multi-channel networks are today, maker, Full screen. Well, the, the YouTube channels. Yeah, the you. YouTube. And what those are is they're, they're networks of channels under one umbrella so they're that the they're new, selling. They're against. the new cable network, basically. Yeah, they're, 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 sort yeah, of. yeah, they're like yeah. the cable, uh, yeah, I still call it M MSO, right? right. The multi system multi -service, right. Yeah, service operator. Yeah. Uh, they have a new name now, yeah. MV. PH. Something complex. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I'll get it eventually. Yeah. Uh, but um, where's the alphabet man? <laughs> <laughs> um, the the uh, so I I've looked at it and said again, how does a traditional U.S. production company slash 
media company like Banerjee have a consumer direct relationship. So where this has to go is companies like ours have to have a relationship with the consumer and not rely 100% on a third party distributor slash network. Okay. And I think that's a really important thing that any company in this space has to look at, right? Because today you have, I'll call it kids, Mm -hmm. right? Who can be in their garage and create great content and get it to an audience. And become millionaires. And become millionaires and build up a great (laughs) audience. Where was YouTube when I was a kid? That's right. You know, and, and, and that's really powerful. And so the the question for traditional media companies is how do you compete? How do you compete in that that business? Uh, and and we still add a tremendous amount of value because again, as I said at the beginning of this, w- the network's trust that we can deliver, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So looking at how a we have a direct consumer relationship and build out that our own channel vertical brand mm-hmm. and control that process. And would is it be called BM Productions or BM Channel? I don't think. Something? I don't think BM Channel yeah, means yeah. something else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here have all you, week. Have you seen your BM today? <laughs> that's right. Whoa. All right. This is a family show. That's right. <laughs> um, Everyone cares about that, though. True. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. What, what, if, would, would you brand it its own thing? We would brand it its own thing. I'd okay. look for, a cha- again, a vertical, okay. an audience that is underserved, and how can we best serve so that So you get audience. an arm in there. You're all, you get Absolutely. an arm in there. So that's, yeah. that's one part of it. And again, mm-hmm. being diversified, right? right? Looking at how are we creating content for the Latin market. Market. How right. are we creating content, you know, for for uh, sitcoms or dramas? How do we, as as a production company, become a studio? Right. So that's really important. And, and that's own. the big the big difference you think between a production company and a studio is the studio's doing all the pieces of the ecosystem. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and and they'll fund, take risks, so they own the IP. Right. Right. And so that's really important, I think, going forward. But so from a digital perspective, though, right, and and that's that's the benefit of what digital technologies have enabled us, right, is that we can have those channels, we can have that distribution, and there isn't the cost structure that there used to be to build the network. Right, right. It's not like you don't have to risk everything. Right. And you you make tiny inroads and tiny successes, and then you bang on them. And so, and I think everyone I'm hearing now kind of wants to make sure they're playing all ends, right? So if you look at, like, who is studio, who is network, who is content creator, there's no lines anymore. Right. Well, look know. at look at Fremantle. Fremantle is a great example of they've put investment towards uh, P- Pet Collective, Style Hall. They bought into or created shows. They these. Bought into shows. Well, the the channels, Brands, channels, these, right. these channels, these. But verticals. am I supposed to, as a consumer, know the name Fremantle? No, and that's and that going back to your question is yeah. would there be a Bjorn and Murray channel? No, Bjorn and Murray's not the consumer name. It's not. We don't have a consumer site. We're not. You've yeah. seen our logo at the end of many shows. Right. And when I go speak at colleges or different events, and people see that Bjorn and Murray logo, everybody goes, "I recognize that." Right. You know, because they they've seen it for twenty right, years. Right. Right. Um, but that's but that wouldn't be the consumer brand right. because we you know one of the things that um, when I look at a consumer brand. I think uh, a company like Machinima did well is they created that as a name. That's a brand. That's right. a network brand right, that right. people recognize. A maker or a full screen aren't necessarily consumer brands. Now, right. they may become work them. to become that, right. but initially they started as a company name. Right, right, right. right. That's like the, the mothership, and then you don't. it doesn't matter. But you're basically, you're just going to get your feet in the sand so that you guys play with everything. Correct. And more important than anything else is, where are you going to maybe go on vacation? I think that's what we all want to know. <laughs> well, I have to I have to say, historically, our vacations have been to visit either my family back yes, east or my wife's family up north. Yes. yes. And we, we probably aren't going to take a vacation this summer, but our next real vacation destination, we are looking at London. Wow, yes. nice. And I taking all the been. kids? Never been I to have London never been, yeah, with which your is like odd. global production career thing. Wow, that kind of blows my mind. Yeah, away. I've 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 gotten close many times, and then for whatever various reason, I get sidetracked and have to go somewhere else, like Istanbul or something. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll say hello to the Queen when you're there thank for you. me. Um, so we're going to wrap it up oh. now, and uh, I want to thank the fabulous. I mean, come on, what a great conversation we had. Thank you. Yeah. What, Thank what you. don't you know? Thank you, All right. well, hey. I didn't know we had this huge yeah, studio audience. Yeah, they've been audience. here the whole time. Oh, my goodness. They've been here the whole time. 
<laughs> I had my back to them. I'm so so embarrassed. You didn't feel the them hitting the buzzer the <laughs> back there. Yeah. Get off stage. Yeah, that's I right. was waiting for the big hook. That's right. We don't do hooks and. I only have 1940 references. <laughs> Clearly, I'm a lot older than you think. You're, well, you do look good though. But it has been fabulous. You are one of the wisest, smartest guys I know, and one of the nicest guys. And so wise about great books to read and things like that. So thank you again, and we'll be looking out for some of the new shows. On, should we go to the what website should we go to to check out you know the shows that are coming out? Is uh, well, uh, um, Spin Media is definitely one, um, and then we do have uh, another show that hasn't been announced yet that will be launched across multiple YouTube channels, and it's uh, you'll find it uh, by Dorm Makeovers. Oh, is, is fun. what we did. Ooh, I like that so, one. So yeah, there you're hearing it here first, wow. and it's pretty exciting. We have uh, some of the top YouTube channels and and personalities as a part of this oh, series. Oh, how fun! Yeah, so oh, we got I to work with that. them and surprise some college kids and really help them. Oh, with their like heroes yeah, showing help, up. Help them with you know Smart. create their best year ever by reinventing their environment. Wow, what a great idea! Well, I love that. Well, I'm Lori Schwartz. This is World of Schwartz. I'm managing partner at Storytech here bi-weekly bringing you the latest technology trends. Such a pleasure to have Mr. Daniel Tibbetts here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And please check us out, email us, ping us, download us, do whatever you want to us as long as it's legal. Thank you so much. <laughs> and come again. Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com.